Well, uh, I'm excited that we're with uh, Mark Clark from Village Church, um, author of Problem of God, and a friend of Connexus, most of all. And Mark, you've been, yeah, you've been my, fa- my favorite church in Canada. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, oh, oh. Well, well, is this going on the on the Village YouTube page or on the? That's Connexus? right. That's right. No, I'm kidding. Love, love my yeah. people. Uh, Mark, we've loved having you over the course of this Versus series. It's been fantastic. And uh, I wanted to, you know, we said to people, hey, bring your questions as you're hearing from Mark. Uh, you've been gracious enough to say, hey, I'd be willing to take some of those questions. And so um, excited to be able to do that today. But, you know, Mark, as we've been doing these tough questions, you've kind of been taking on in the Versus series that sometimes the dichotomy with between two things, sometimes the false dichotomy I know yeah. you get a ton of the like big questions that people have. Yeah. I would love to hear, you know, all the questions that you end up answering uh, regularly. What's really behind people's big questions? You know, when you get these big questions from people, is yeah. it just, it's a knowledge based thing. You've talked about the fact that, you know, reason is an on ramp to faith. Um, I'd love to just hear your perspective on where yeah. people's questions come from. Yeah, I think they come from uh, two two places, and, and I'll illustrate that through the way that my book is organized. So if you if you read the problem of God, you have like the first four chapters, right? And they're like science and faith, you know, the the proofs for God, um, the Christ myth, and the Bible. And those four questions are what I would call um, kind of evidential questions. They're questions mm-hmm. of science, facts, history. You know, all of that. Like, does in the world of facts, is this legitimate, right? Is, is right. believing in Christianity legitimate? So, so there's evidential thinkers out there who really need these questions answered in order to bring credibility to any worldview that they want to adopt in their life. And so they want to know, what does archaeology say about the Bible? It's true or false. I mean, it's either Pilate was real when Jesus was around or he wasn't. And if he wasn't, then the Bible throw it all out, you know? So there's people like that and there's those kinds of questions. Um, The second half of the book is what I would say would be called moralistic uh, questions or problems or challenges that people have with Christianity. So hell, uh, sex, uh, hypocrisy in the church. These are, these are like, um, they're doubts, but they're almost like, uh, repulsions more so than like, well, I found a fact and I know that hell isn't real. And so Christianity's wrong. It's like, well, you don't, you just don't like the doctrine of hell. Right. Like the, the, you know, the sexual ethic of Christianity. So you've decided not to be a Christian. And so, I think those two worlds are um, where most questions that people have about Christianity come from. And behind them is just a desire to, A, you know, do I hold a worldview that's true and better than any other worldview? And then B, um, does it does it satisfy my life? You know, right. does it make my life better? Does it fulfill me? And, uh, you know, so it's kind of a fact value thing. And, um, and, and unfortunately, I think, you know, me and you, of course, we're followers of Jesus. So we believe that Christianity is the best fulfillment of both of those things. Um, but uh, some people, you know, they might even get the great answers and then still reject it because they just want to kind of live how they want to live. And even if it's right. a contradiction, they don't really care. Right, right. Well, that's a hard thing to answer. Right. And, and uh, they're not always emotionally satisfying answers, right? That's often people are going, hey, give me an answer that satisfies me emotionally so that I can feel good. But not on every answer is like that. Right. Yeah, in life or in choosing a worldview. So if you're out there and you're trying to, you know, choose a worldview, I would just say, you know, constantly be evaluating, you know, what's the reason I believe this? What's the reason I doubt this? Is there a hidden you know, why behind the why here, am I being honest with myself or do I just believe this because it's whatever, better for my life of pleasure and for the next 10 years or, 
It's easier around the dinner table with friends, you know, easier at the office. Well, those aren't great reasons to probably adopt an entire worldview for your life. (laughs) So at least if you're honest with that, then we can get somewhere, you know, so. Right. Well, uh, we've got both kinds of questions here. And uh, we asked you at Connect says, hey, submit your questions for Mark. You're so gracious to do that. Uh, You submitted 30 to 40 questions in the end. Um, I kind of went through them, found the most common ones, put them together. If we didn't get to your question, uh, you know, send me an email. I'm sure we can figure out an opportunity to do that. But um, I think I got to most of them. And so we're going to do a few of these today. Uh, The first one says, over the course of history, uh, the church or Christianity has come across as anti-science. In fact, it seems that the church originally initiated the dichotomy between faith and science. And uh, a couple people talked about, you know, Galileo uh, getting pushed out of the Catholic Church and then, you know, giving up some of his findings in order to be accepted to the church again. Yeah. Uh, Copernicus, that kind of thing. Uh, why do you think the church is, the Big C Church is, by and large, so anti-science or comes across that way? Yeah, I think um, if you look through history, for the most part, and I actually talk about this in one of the chapters in The Problem of God, too, where I go through the Copernicus thing and Bruno and, like, some of its mythology. Um, in fact, Alison McGrath says that the idea that science and, and the church clashed is, like, the, the last bastion of bad atheistic mythology because when you go back, it really – it really didn't try to snuff these guys. Um, when you find some examples of this, um, oftentimes actually the problem is more a, uh, like uh, in the case of a few guys, it was like they had Trinitarian uh, problems that the Catholic church didn't like. It wasn't, it wasn't their view of science. It was their view of like Jesus and the Trinity. Now, right. not burning those guys at the stake was a good thing. That's kind of a different question, but it wasn't for science that they were burning them at the stake. I think, in fact, I mean, you can, you can go back, um, go back and read Augustine's uh, or uh, uh, Calvin's interpretation of Genesis one and two. These guys weren't, um, you know, uh, literal in the sense that sometimes we are like throughout church history, there's been a very wide kind of view on these things so that you could read the Adam and Eve story as poetry and really not like it wasn't until the last hundred years that there was some dichotomy where it was like, no, this has to be this. And so the church always had a pretty, um, pretty open poetic view of the biblical text at times so that it, in what scenario would it actually be clashing against science? No, no theologian, you know, worth his salt was reading, you know, the, the four corners of the earth, and then thinking the earth was flat. Like, that's not a thing. Like we, so we, there might be some guy off in a corner doing that, but there's guys off in the corner doing a lot of wacky things still today. Uh, You know, and then get into that if you want, but it's like (laughs) the church, like the, the solid, the theologians of the church, you know, they weren't combating against Christianity. In fact, even when um, Darwin started to do his work, uh, the, or, or even the Big Bang discussion, the church didn't react and say, oh my gosh. They were just like, oh, cool. We got some data on right, the details right. of, of the how. You know, there was no, oh, great. All of, all, everything that exists came into existence in a single moment of mass explosion. Oh, that sounds like Genesis 1-1. Moving on. You know, it, it, so really... You know, when you look back at the history of the church, there there really wasn't um, a massive, you know, conflict between science and faith. I, again, there were little moments, but a lot of those scientific guys, if they were burned at the stake or put in prison or whatever, it was oftentimes for theological heresies, not scientific theories. Right. And so, uh, so that's one thing to get right. And then in the last 100, 150 years, um, you know, the fundamentalist sect of the church probably has been seen as uh, anti-science. But then again, you go and you look at great scientists in the last hundred years, 
the the polking horns and the the mcgraths and the francis collins and the, all of the you know the kenneth millers and all these guys they're they're theists they're christians alvin plantiga the greatest living philosopher in the world um is these guys are christians and so yes there are corners of christianity that posit a, a question which is you either believe science or you believe the bible um but I would say the overwhelming reality of history and thinkers in the present, that's just not the case. So, right. So why it has been the case is because of the popularized question, mostly of the evolutionary question, which we dealt with uh, in, in one of the weeks. But I would say that's probably the most popular, you know, of the, you can either be a Christian or believe in science thing. And I think that's become more nuanced, you know, in the last 30 or 40 years as well. So. Right. Right. Now and on the creation side, there are a few questions that came in, I think pre your message, creation evolution on, you know, timelines and is a day actually a day and all that stuff. So if for those sure. of you who had those questions, you should go back and listen to part two. If, if you haven't done that yet. Uh, one of the questions that came out of that was out of that message was, if we all came from Adam and Eve, how are there so many races and different colors of people today? And does that mean that God condones incest because Adam and Eve were the original kind of original parents? Right. Thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a fascinating world, right? Um, when you go back and read that story. So I think, I think there's so much going on in that. It's a beautiful poetic Hebrew around the fire story with so much going right. on and sometimes we come with our modern questions and and it's hard because some of it is ambiguous uh and you don't want to push the bible and out bible the bible you don't want to right. create theology that the bible doesn't create you know it's kind of like the question of where did evil come from it's like literally the bible is dead silent on the question of the origin of evil the serpent is just there you know, in Genesis three, it doesn't say, and then God did this. And it's like, we don't know, man. It's like this weird mystery. And so where there is mystery, I don't want to, you know, destroy it in a sense. And so there's times in the Bible where it's like, oh, that's interesting. There seems to be a part of this story that people, that we're not being told. Right. Why by the time of Cain and Abel, are there other people walking around? What, who are they? Where, I thought we just had Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. I didn't know we right. had a bunch of other people, you know, and so where did they come from? I don't understand what's going on. And so, um, so, you know, you, you begin, so, so with that kind of uh, let's allow the mystery a bit. Um, there could have been a situation where like um, Adam and Eve's kids are sleeping with their sisters or whatever, because there's so many of them. It's just a different time. It's a different area. It's not the, it's not the same as it is now. Right. Um, it's just a, it's a literally a different world. Um, or there could have been, uh, as we talked about in the message, there could have been other versions of humankind. Like we talked about the whole, like, it's not evolution, but it's, it's um, come, come to the, come to the angle on the questioner when they're asking about different races. I think what happens is there is micro evolution or adaptation to certain areas. Um, and again, I'm not a scientist, so other people would be able to answer this better. But I know that if you map out the origin of certain races and you look at certain things about their bodies and hair and not hair and certain sizes of certain different things, it's oftentimes an adaptation to the environment that they actually spent hundreds of thousands of years in. Right. Right. And so that's where you get those different versions of, you know, I'm not as hairy as my Italian friends. You know, right, right. 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 It's like, where did that come from? It's like, there are different, you know, th there's just different adaptations within species according to the environments that those people groups that didn't, there wasn't the travel and the intermingling that there is today. I mean, even I just wrote a book on Jesus uh, that comes out in the new year. And I was uh, in my chapter on the historical Jesus. I talked about the fact that, you know, he grew up in Galilee. It was, it was 64 miles away from Jerusalem. And we only are told in John that if we take John's account, maybe Jesus went 
to Jerusalem three times in his life. If you read the synoptics, he only goes once. He's only, he's only an hour drive. So what's he doing? Why is he going down where the action is, where the elite right. guys are like, boom. Jesus probably never traveled the hundred miles away from where he was born his entire life. You know, right. that is fascinating to think about. And so you see these, it isn't until the last, you know, 200 years that you get all of this migration of people groups and everybody intermingling and all of that. So I think uh, that's where some of the race comes from. Everyone's made in the image of God. And then there's an adaptation that starts to take place with certain environments that, you know, humankind lives in with languages and cultures and all that kind of stuff. At least that's, that's my understanding of it. Again, maybe there's some socio- sociologist going, that's all ridiculous and that's not actually how it happened. But that, that's my understanding of it. Well, and then I think as you're saying, not to out Bible to Bible and allow for the mystery of some of it. I get that too. But I understand for people there, everybody's wrestling with that in some respect. Yeah. So Yeah, of course. Yeah. I get that. Uh, okay. How are we able to be sure of the existence of a soul or a spirit, a personal soul? Um, what gives us a reason to believe that we aren't just our brains or our minds? Yeah. Well, um, it's, a, yeah, it's a heavy philosophical question because um, what, what if I was to say your soul, in a sense, is your mind, right? I mean, we're going to get a little matrixy here, but, uh, you know, it's like, you know, I, so I believe in the soul, right? right. But, but what is, when we say the word soul, we think of like a little ghost circle in my chest, you know? Right. And it's, it's the same, it's the same. I like to make fun of the, um, the preacher who goes, you know, he's got these little preachy lines and one of them is like, has it moved from, what is this line? The, the, the 12 inches from your head to your heart. Or right, whatever. right, right. It's like, it's like when the Bible uses the word heart, it doesn't mean, why do we point here? Because this isn't the thing. This is a, this is something that pumps, uh, you know, pumps blood through our veins. It's like an actual that's not our heart. Our heart is up here. It actually be smarter to go. Has it moved from the six inches from your brain to your heart? And then point here again, because what are we, we are, um, right. You know, we are thoughts, we are thinking our soul, you know, and, and the whole work on soul is fascinating in itself. I, I heard Rowan Williams talk about this a long time ago and he asked this question. Now he never really answered it. So I'm not really going to be an answer for people, but he re- at least raised a question. He said, I think, Sometimes we think, and, and he tapped into something that I, I, you know, I thought about. It's like we think there's like this conveyor belt in heaven of souls hanging on these hooks. And then when we're born, God like assigns one to a person and right. then them, you know, it's like these weird images in our brain. Right. Uh, and he kind of said, is that really what the Bible means by soul? Or are we shaped by our environment? Is this, you know, all of that. So we are mind, we are body, we are soul. Um, but so much of that is actually our brain and, uh, how our brain cognitively affects our feelings and our affections and what we know and love, whatever. So I think maybe what's behind the question is this sense of, are we more than just meat on a stick? You know, are, is there something transcendent about us? even if it's communicated in some way through brain activity. And I would say, yes, now proving that is hard other than there's a lot of psychologists that actually talk about the idea that modern psychology, the more it delves into the working of the brain, the more it begins to notice that there is, we seem to be more than a brain. The right. bottom line is we, we seem to have, affections, desires, morality that transcends brain activity in certain ways. And they're, they're, you know, looping people up to stuff on their brains and tracking what happens when they feel pain and pleasure and all this stuff. And the conclusion of modern psychology, even atheists, is there's just something else going on. And I remember um, uh, I watched a debate between Richard Dawkins and someone a long time ago, and they were talking about this. And and, and Dawkins was talking about the fact that we, uh, he said, we, we, we haven't had our Darwin yet when it comes to the, the soul, but don't worry about it. One day we will. I just don't know when that time's going to be yet. But we're mm-hmm. basically computer programs right now 
but we seem to have something else going on. We just don't know what that is yet, which is a, you know, it's a faith position he's holding because he's saying right. my theories can't actually explain the soul, but don't worry. Um, AI in the future and computer analysis in the future will be able to do it. So it's, you know, it's funny, you know, just push it off into the future kind of question. But um, yeah, so I think love and art and beauty um, are these things that, that, that kind of transcend the computer part of us, you know, that, that are hard to explain outside of uh, a kind of soul scenario. So yeah, and, and I, don't know, I don't know where the person is coming from, ask the, where they're coming from, will ask the question. But Christianity, of course, isn't the only religion that holds fast to the idea that we have a soul. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, th- there's all kinds of people who would, who would see that, that we would. But um, it's interesting to kind of look at, um, you know, th- the Dawkins thing is really interesting how he's sort of t- taking the faith position. Rec- it's interesting. It shows a bit of a leaning, taking a bit of a faith position there. Um, yeah, okay. and, and I think I think a true naturalist, an atheistic thinker who's who's trying to deduce everything through naturalistic evolutionary theory, uh, I think what Dawkins is trying to say is I do bump up against the science that's saying we're more than just brains on a stick. There's something else going on. I don't know what it is yet, but there's something they're just bumping up against. It. Yeah, interesting. Okay, uh, we got this one a couple of times. Uh, does it matter what you believe as long as you're a good person? Uh, what if I see Jesus as someone who was a political rebel who threatened the peace and the power structure and brought moral teaching, but was not the son of God sacrificed on the cross? Yeah. Um, so there's two kind of questions in that, right? There's a Jesus question and then there's a good, you know, a good question. I mean, um, I think biblically speaking, um, the gospel is about the fact that we, we aren't good in, you know, Romans three. Um, but what it means by that isn't that we don't build hospitals and do philanthropic work and, you know, like children and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's that we're not, we're not ultimately good. We're not, you know, forensically righteous in the, in the courtroom, you know, of God in his, his, uh, the, the, the uh, standard for being able to be in his presence forever, you know, and, and it, what's fascinating about the question of good, of course, is you start to, you know, delve into your motive of why somebody's good. Is it totally altruistic or is it selfish? Is it narcissistic in the end? You know, why do I love my wife? Is it so that I can get something out of it? You know, it's right. kind of the, and the end of the day, is anyone really just purely good for good's sake? Or are they good because their tribe's going to then build a relationship with that tribe and they can protect their children if I disappear? And, you know, all of that kind of fascinating kind of sociological theory. But at the end of the day, from a biblical perspective, no one's good enough um, to, you know, be in the presence of God or be in the new creation or, you know, classic go to heaven language uh, without that perfect righteousness of Jesus being applied to them. Um, And so it's fascinating because oftentimes Christian preaching and theology kind of um, downplays that aspect of, of me. You you don't. So here's the thing. Uh, If, if you and I preach the gospel and you know, I I do it all time and guilty of it. And all we say is Jesus is going to forgive your sin. Great. So, so here's what happens then. Then you're just neutral because all that's happened is your sin is forgiven. But that's not actually the need. You actually need righteousness. Right. So if all we preach is you're going to get forgiven of your sin, great. Now I'm back to square one. I'm not actually where I need to be. Where I need to be is I need to get the righteousness of Christ applied to me so that God, I can be in the presence of God. So it's it's what theologians call passive and active righteousness. Uh, and so... Uh, I think we need to preach that more almost. And I'm guilty of not actually, you know, following through on that because, you know, everyone's bored or whatever. So I'm trying to get to the next point or something. Um, so anyway, all that to say, we need almost like an alien goodness uh, that's given to us. So that's, that's the, that's can, I, can I ask you a follow up on that, Mark? So talk to me about 
do you think we we preach as Christians we 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 like to talk about the goodness of God but we confuse it with the holiness of God like like there was a day uh, two decades ago where all preachers preached about was the holiness of God mm. now you hear it a lot more rarely but you hear a lot more about the goodness of God right but, like why do you think that is i think uh partly because the holiness of God seems to be about God mm-hmm. or the goodness of God seems to quickly be about me. Right. And so if he's good, that's going to affect me and my family and my life. And I think uh, we're getting more, we want to, you know, we want to appeal to people get bored. If I get up and preach a sermon for 30 minutes and it's only about God, you know, everyone's like, Hey, when's this going to be about me? You know, right. I mean, whether they say that at the coffee shop or not, that, hey, preacher, I wish you'd just preach about God more. What they really mean is they'd be bored of that series in about two weeks, right. you know, because what's this have to do with me and my bills and my marriage that's falling apart and my neighbor who hates me and whatever. And so I think preachers are, uh, are tend to go, man, life is challenging and whatever. So let's talk about the goodness of this God. And there's something to that, right? Because I want people to be drawn to God, not just drawn away from sin. And so what am I going to talk about so that you actually fall in love with God? You know, this goes back to Jonathan Edwards and all the guys who are going, look, let's hold up a God that people actually will love, not just like. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so maybe you need to talk about the goodness of God for that reason, not just his holiness. So anyway, so maybe that's why. Okay, I want to get back to the second half of that question. Yes. Um, what Jesus. if I see Jesus as someone who's basically a moral teacher or a political rebel, but not the Son of God sacrificing yeah. on the cross? Yeah, and just, just to follow up on the good part and segue into that too, the problem with deducing, as my family and friends do, that they don't need Jesus because they're good, is that good is somewhat of a culturally relative term because mm-hmm. to be good in Saudi Arabia – is different than to be good in Canada. So what do you mean by good? Do you mean your latte drinking, you know, post-Christian, post-Enlightenment Western version of good? Or do you mean what people in Saudi Arabia mean by good? So uh, Mm -hmm. that becomes a moving target. Whereas, no, we got to figure out what God says is good and then realize that we fall short of that. Um, The Jesus question as a segue over, Jesus is, of course, the one who actually accomplishes the righteousness that we need. So he's more than a teacher and a political leader. Um, he was those things. You know, I, I, again, in my, in my book about this, I, I talk about that one of the core categories that historical Jesus scholars give to Jesus is a, a parabolist. Like he's a teacher. He's a teacher of parables. If you were around at the time, he'd be walking around telling parables. And so I say in the chapter, if he was around today, maybe he'd make movies. You know, he'd tell stories that upend people's worldviews and reshuffle the furniture in their brains. Maybe not be in a church, you know, with a three-piece suit on preaching a sermon behind a pulpit. So he was a teller of stories. But in his teaching, he claims some stuff. And so come back to C.S. Lewis' point that if, you know, saying that Jesus was a good teacher but not God is, is wrong because he claimed to be God, uh, over and over and over again. And so you either have to think he's a lunatic who is actually betraying billions of people throughout history on purpose, uh, or he's a liar who is just making stuff up, uh, or that he actually was the son of God, kind of that trichotomy of question of what are you going to do with him? And so uh, he can't be a good teacher. Here's my point. And be a good prophet and be a good political leader and not be God uh, because he claimed to be both. Mm-hmm. And so you can't leave the one out and say, I'll just take this piece of Jesus because if he wasn't God, then he wasn't actually a good teacher or a good political leader because he was a liar and he led people astray. And so you got to kind of deal with, okay, was he really God? And if he's not God, fine, then let's just say that reject him. Cause as John Stott pointed out, there was only two kinds of people. When you read the gospels, there were people who followed and loved Jesus and people wanted to throw him off a cliff. There was not the uh, middle road Canadian nicety version where, you know, I wear a Jesus is my homeboy t-shirt, but I don't worship him. Right. Right. Yeah. And if you're the person asking that question, man, you're down a really great path. Yeah. So totally. Keep going. I love yep. it. Okay. Um, 
So this one, it says, I've often heard ministers say that Christianity is inclusive, um, that's open to everyone, yet they maintain this is so only if one has certain beliefs, such as Jesus is God, died on a cross for our sins, that Jesus is the only means to salvation. Yet I've heard other churches state that there are many paths to God, recognizing that they're saying that the Christian understanding is limited by an incomplete comprehension of God. So these churches would argue that the Holy Spirit is able to work through all faiths, including non-Christian faiths, uh, and that this seems to be more inclusive view. Why can't God use many paths to get to himself? Right. Well, um, <clears throat> any question that's like, why can't God is hard because God, you know, can do anything. I think that uh, he doesn't because it would be a contradiction in terms. So I think uh, uh, people who say, you know, you know, all religions are basically the same and, you know, they're all kind of doing their just different paths to the same end. They, they really haven't delved into religions beyond kind of the surface level, you know, golden rule kind of stuff, you know, because once you do, once you go even level two, you realize that they all contradict each other at the most fundamental foundation, essential levels. Mark, give, 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 me an, give me an example of that. Some people might be wondering, hey, what do you mean by that? Okay, we'll take, uh, take uh, their version of God. Right. Uh, so, so Hinduism believes in millions of gods. Buddhism doesn't believe in God, that there is any God. Uh, 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 Judaism believes in one God. Islam is a Unitarian version of God, very strict monotheism. And Christianity is a monotheistic Trinitarian version of God. So how can you possibly, you know, you have this, uh, they contradict each other at every terms in relationship to God, the way of salvation, you know, Islam says you have to do these things in order to, you know, maybe be good enough to go to heaven when you die. Christianity says, no, that's literally the opposite of the gospel that Jesus came and accomplished this for you, that you could never do this on your own. Um, you know, a new age philosophy tells you to go inside of yourself um, believes in pantheism or panantheism where everything is either God or everything is part of the divine, which becomes hugely problematic because as N.T. Wright has said, like if everything is part of the divine, then that means cancer cells and tsunamis right. are part of the divine. And then here's what's crushing about it. Who do you look to to save you if you're divine and you know you're broken. There's nothing outside of you to save. So all of these are uh, visions of hell, salvation, God, uh, everything. Uh, origins, meaning, morality, destiny, every single part. Like before I became a Christian, Jeff, I almost became a Mormon. Because wow, Mormon, I didn't know that. Yeah, because Mormons had got to me before Christians had. And uh, something about the transcendent, was interesting. And so I was talking and they would come, you know, every day and we would chat through it. And I started reading the book of Mormon and you realize you can't, you, you, these two things cannot coexist, right? Either the, either Mormonism is true or Christianity is true. They can't both be true. And it's, it's really such a us reading the net to teleprompter of our culture to try to come up with a, 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 a universalistic, version of salvation where everyone can just take their own route. We're all going to the same place. Um, you know, it, it really is just to get through Thanksgiving dinner easier and get through coworkers easier. And, right. and it, it's really more about us than it is about truth. And I think that's, what's hard about it is let's, you know, let's, let's have the hard conversations and discover truth. Even if we have to say Christianity in the, in the end, you know, was proven false. They dug up the bones of Jesus and they found them. Well, there's no point in going, well, Christianity, it's a nice spiritual teaching. So let's just continue to believe it because it's just our way to God. It's like, no, no, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Christianity's wrong. Right. There's no point pretending it's right. It's wrong, factually. And so I think what's happened in our culture, we have this, you know, fact value split. And what, what has happened is what you, in modernity, the fact down here, you know, science, truth, 
And then you have the value, the top, which is like how I feel, you know, subjective morality. These things have flipped where now, you know, the values have become the foundation and uh, how you feel is now the most, it's what you need to orient your thinking around and is the truth more so than those, you know, facts and history and all that kind of stuff. It's more about how you feel. And that's kind of got the driver's seat. And I think that's partly why kind of that postmodern, you know, um, thinking is, is partly why we like this version. But the reality is at the end of the day, um, whether you interpret two plus two to be five or not, um, two plus two is four. And so, um, you know, the, the, I'm not saying you're not going to get your math equations wrong. Um, I'm just saying uh, there is reality. And I think reality is what we have to go after really hard and not abandon it or sacrifice it so that we can. It's, it, I, I talk about this uh, in The Problem of God as well, where it's called the difference between pluralism culturally, you know, where we all, we live in Canada, a mosaic, and there's all kinds of different religions. And we as Christians should fight for those religions to have a voice 100%. But it's metaphysical pluralism that we jump into that's wrong that we should fight for people to have believe whatever they want to believe the the jump we make is we say they're right in believing it and that's what that's what gets us into trouble because then we don't end up with with truth or fighting at all you know i remember that there's a very famous interview with a with a a, a canadian uh psychologist um and uh, the, the woman's kind of you know, uh, saying, well, you shouldn't say that. It's kind of uncomfortable to believe what you want to believe. And he pushes back and he says, but it's uncomfortable for me, for you to believe what you believe. And you're coming at me with all these questions. Does that mean you shouldn't ask them? And she kind of stops and she's like, oh, you kind of got me. I don't really know what to say to that. It's like, are we going to say because it's uncomfortable for you to challenge my beliefs, we should stop challenging them? No, that's, that's a way toward nowhere. So anyway, so that's kind of the, uh, I think it's not logical to believe that all different paths lead to God. I think it, it, it makes logical sense what Jesus says, which is I'm the only way to the father, mm-hmm. you know, you know, it's Peter preaching in acts four, you know, there's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. And it's like, this is the way it's happened because God came down the mountain in Jesus this is it. And he goes, the path is narrow. The way is super narrow and very few find it. That's literally the teachings of Jesus. So you can throw out the teachings of Jesus and believe what you want as you sit around and eat a buffet and feel good about yourself, but it would directly defy Jesus. Yeah. And I think for, for people who are watching, you know, uh, one of the things we've encouraged at our church uh, from time to time, and I think it's good to always encourage is, don't just read the stuff that confirms what you already believe, but go find those other things, those other faiths, read about them. I think people get intimidated by this question because they don't, they haven't spent the time to dig in and read the other things. I sure. think sometimes out of fear, really. Right. Um, yes. And you know, you could argue it's laziness, but you know, I think in a lot of cases it's, it's fear. It's just, well, if I read that, am I going to get mixed up? And I think, right. um, you know, Christianity yep. is um, either true or it's not true. And don't, don't believe it blindly. Don't, you know, yep. don't be afraid. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this one came up a couple of times. I thought this was the best version of uh, these questions that I got. It says, when I look at the life of Jesus, I see someone who lived a life of humility, taught us to serve the world around us. He pushed against pride. He pushed against ego. However, when I read, when I try to read the Bible, I feel as though God is both prideful and egotistical. So it's the person of Jesus, the person of God. I know that he created all, so he's worthy to be honored, but the way God controls all to achieve his purposes is very challenging. In the end, it feels like our purpose is just to die and worship an egotistical God in heaven. How do I explain the dichotomy between what I see in the character of Jesus and what I see in the character of God? Yeah, I would say the dichotomy is false. So um, what you see in the person of Jesus, I mean, 
go watch. There's a brilliant movie that came out about 20 years ago called The Gospel of John. It's by a brilliant director. It's artistically really respected. Uh, and it's the guy from Lost, the Scottish guy from Lost. Is, is oh, Jesus, yeah. Right? Um, so, so it's literally the Gospel of John from start to finish. Three hours, word for word. Uh, halfway through the movie, you say to yourself, I can see why they killed this guy. My wife actually turned to me halfway through the movie and went, I kind of get why they didn't like him. Mm. Um, because I don't know what parts of the New Testament people kind of pick through, but uh, Jesus was very exclusive and very like, I'm the only way, I'm redrawing everything. Even if you're Jewish, the time's over now. Now it's me. So you've been right, right. until now, but I'm the new temple. I'm the new water. I'm the bread. I'm the every, I'm everything. I'm everything. I even Passover, our most sacred of, of meals. Thousands of years, we sit around, we do the this, and we eat the spice, and we tell our kids, and it's a whole long thing. What do you think the Last Supper is? It's him reforming Passover and saying, I'm, I, you know that stuff you, I'm it. I'm the body. I'm the blood. I'm the whole, you thought that lamb saved you? No, it's me now. I'm the new, I'm new Exodus. I'm new everything. I'm Moses. I'm the Torah. I'm God. I'm everything. This, right. this guy um, blew it all up. And so if we're going to say someone was egotistical, you got to take the whole corpus of Jesus' life and go, this guy was egotistical. This, he said, it's all wrong now. And I'm the only thing that's right. And if you don't, it, you know, it's funny. I was, I was watching Deepak Chopra who's a new age philosopher. And he goes, you know, I don't believe in all this Jesus and, you know, all this hell and judgment and all this kind of stuff. You know, he goes, you got to just read the Sermon on the Mount. That's the spirit of Jesus of Nazareth. And have you read the Sermon on the Mount? Literally, it's where he talks about hell the most. It's like, you know, pluck out your eyes if you lust after women because it's better to have, you know, no eyeballs and go to heaven than have two and go to hell, you know, hell, hell, hell all the time. And so Jesus was, uh, he had wrath and he talked about wrath. He wasn't afraid of wrath. He talked about holiness. He talked about, he talked about exclusivity. He talked about hell. He talked about these things. So my first point would be the dichotomy between whatever our version of God and Jesus is, is wrong. As D.A. Carson years ago said, if we're going to say that we think in the New Testament that love got ratcheted up in Jesus, we also have to say that wrath got ratcheted up in Jesus because we don't even get the doctrine of hell or ju eternal judgment in the way that we get in the New Testament until we get to Jesus. You go back in the Old Testament, it's pretty generic. You die, your bones go in the ground, you become like an animal or whatever, like, a, you know, like Job talks about, or, you know, maybe the most fleshed out is like Daniel 12, you get a glimmer of resurrection unto judgment and right. resurrection unto life. That's it. You don't really get much else. And then Jesus shows up and he's like, here we go. Here's what, it, here's what happens. So anyway, all that to say, I think the dichotomy is false. Um, but the point of the question being about um, ego and narcissism anyway, I think, I think one of the best things I've read on this is uh, Jonathan Edwards or even uh, John Piper's book, um, Desiring God, the first few chapters, because of course his, his philosophy, which a lot of people struggle with, is that God, and I think it's biblical, that God, the thing God is most into is his own glory. That's the whole premise of that book. And you go, he goes to Isaiah and Ezekiel and Romans nine, and that literally what God, the most God oriented person in the universe is God. It, even, even in uh, Psalm 23, you know, it's like, you know, I, I put you beside still waters and yada, yada, yada for my namesake, everything he does is for his own name and his own glory. You know, you read Romans 9, it's like, why did you bring down these judgments on Egypt and Pharaoh so that I would manifest my glory? You know, John 9, why is this guy blind? Because God wanted to manifest his own glory. It's like, what? This is crazy. Right. You know, so it's like, 
But so then Piper goes, okay, so now we know biblically everything God does is for his own glory. But there's a follow-up question to that. Why is that any good? <laughs> you know, like, why is that a thing? And his answer, I think, is brilliantly, well, it's two things. The first one is, if God cared more about anything else than his own glory, he would by nature then, by definition, be an idolater. So I think that's fascinating. Literally, he would care about something more than himself. More than himself, yeah. No, no one's allowed to do, and the universe would basically just implode. Uh, right. But secondly, um, he says it's because it's what's best for us. When you are wired, and this comes to the nub of what I think to be somewhat of an answer uh, to the question, when you're wired by your creator to flourish best when you're interlocked with him, meaning bringing him glory, and glory, of course, means uh, like weight. Um, when your life is, is feeling and projecting the weight of his glory, not your own, uh, that's the best thing for you in your sex life and your money life and your family life and your work life. You will be most fulfilled because that's the way you were designed. So in the end, it's actually for our good that he tells us, make sure you're glorifying me above yourself. Make sure. And then, so that's true in a million different ways. And we could spend the next two hours talking about that. But then there's another really practical piece to it, which is like, man, if my marriage, Jeff, is about the glory of God, then I can like, whew, take a breath for a sec. You know, right. let that freedom just breeze through your hair at this point. Because it's like, all right it's about something bigger than me. Um, and it's not just about us getting along and having a good time and speaking each other's love languages. Cause when we fail that, you know, we feel all the weight of it because that was the purpose and meaning of our whole existence. But when it's about God, then when I'm stuck in traffic, it, the universe ain't about me. So just chill, you know, when I'm having troubles with my kids, the universe ain't about, you know, so Everything gets framed different and it actually starts to affect my psychology, you know, in a, in a, in a positive flourishing way. So, so, so in a sense, what you're saying is if someone's going, Hey, I'm looking for my purpose. And so what we'll often do is say, Hey, if you're looking for your purpose, like here's our personality assessment and let's find out what your spiritual gifts are and all those sorts of things. But, but purpose is greater than that in the sense, um, glorifying God is a greater purpose. Yeah. And I think communism proves that. I mean, I'm reading uh, this book, The Devil's Delusion by David Berlinski. The guy's a, a secular Jew. And his whole point is uh, without some kind of theistic narrative, we're lost. We're done. Like right. we don't, Western civilization is done. All joy, all meaning, all purpose. Atheism can't answer the deepest questions of the soul. Um and so you need to posit a transcendent, you know, reality into this for, for anything to make sense. And it's like, it's the opening line of the purpose driven life, right? Best selling book of all time. What's the opening line of that book? It's not about you. Right. You know, you're right. trying to find your purpose in life. Just like you just said, you're trying to find your meaning. And Rick Warren first line out of the book goes, it's not about you. Right. Right. So. Okay. Uh, how does Christianity explain that prayer is effective is the way they worded the question. Well, uh, first off, it would be, um, so, so there's, there's, there's four ways that we kind of learn stuff. Uh, back in the day, it was called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. It's like, uh, you know, four boxes. That's the filter of epistemology or the way that you learn things. So it's like scripture, uh, tradition, um, uh, experience, and uh, reason. Okay? These are the four ways we learn things. Um, so I would say, to understand why Christians would say prayer works, is to go back to those four and go, I just think, A, primarily, Scripture talks about it. You know, you go read the life of Daniel, you go read the, you know, all, all through the Bible, there's prayers and there's answers. There's prayers and there's answers, there's prayers and there's answers. So scripture and then reason, you're, if God exists, he's going to answer prayers in one way or the other. Yes, no, or later, 
is, is are basically the kind of three answers he gives. Um, tradition, you're going to go back to church history and go, my gosh, look at that crazy revival that happened in this. Look at that crazy thing that happened in China. Look at that crazy thing that happened in New York City. You know, I, there was a prayer movement after 9-11 and then church plants went from this to this. Look at that thing that happened in Korea where they prayed 24. Look at that thing in Africa. You go through the church history at every great awakening. And you go, oh my gosh, tradition tells us prayers are actually doing moving history Scripture tells us prayer moves history, tradition, reason, and then experience. Um, you know, how many stories, Jeff, do you have of stuff that's just unexplainable? I'm not talking normal right. little things like I prayed for a parking spot when I went to Walmart and it came and it's like, I believe, but crazy stuff. Right. Um, and so those four things start to stack up and the evidence starts to really push through that prayer might actually be effective. Uh, in, in what it does. Now, of course, it's not God bending to our will. And, you know, there, you got to have a theology of prayer. It's Jesus in the garden saying, I don't want to do this mission anymore. I'm a little freaked out here, but not my will, but yours in the end. You know, it's like our prayer is that God's kingdom come, God's will be done, not that our will and our desire, you know, all that stuff. So, um, so yeah, so I would say those four things kind of come into play and you, you look at those things and you go, man, Prayer, Christian prayer, is actually a, a thing that is effective and works. All right. I'm going to give you this one. It's a quick one. We're near the end here. Um, so we're going to move from prayer to politics. I don't know how to segue that. So uh, <laughs> why do Christians tend to be conservative voters, this person says? Hmm. Uh, what they're really asking is they say, can I have liberal beliefs and be a Christian? I think they're asking from a from a political standpoint. Right, right, right. Uh yeah. Well, so, so the first part of the question is Christians, um, there's a, you know, you, you take, you take a whole list of issues and you go, if I lined up 20 issues that are classically conservative and I'm assuming, let's just assume that we're not going to restructure the words conservative and liberal and go back 200 years. Cause those words didn't mean that, but the present vernacular, I'm assuming that they're talking about. Right. And so, right. um, you know, a list of conservative, you know, issues today and a list of liberal issues, uh, uh, kind of the classic ones. And you're going to find that there are some that sound more Christian on the liberal side of the ledger than the conservative side and vice versa. And so I think when it boils down to a, a few of the really popular ones, like abortion, uh, gay marriage, you know, those kind of things. Uh, Christians begin, you know, the, the, the core thing that defines a Christian worldview is the Bible. And so I remember, you know, we just lost J.I. Packer. And I remember years right. ago, when he came out of the Anglican uh, Diocese of Canada and joined one in like Brazil or something uh, over um, the issue of gay marriage, because they were saying, you know, you have to believe in this in order to be an Anglican priest in Canada and his particular domination. And he came out of it. Um, you know, his point was, this isn't really a sexual issue for me. This is a Bible issue. Right. This is the question of whether I'm going to believe in the authority of the Bible around this issue or not. And so for conservatives, I think they would say, well, you know, abortion, pretty clear, you know, Life begins, the, you know, at conception. You got the Psalms that talk about God stitching you together in their mother's womb. You have this stamp of, you know, all these biblical texts that, you know, you got John the Baptist in there and things are happening in the womb, you know, all this kind of stuff where they would go, man, this isn't even a question. Uh, so if that's going to inform my voting, then I'm going to be conservative. If it's, you know, hey, the freedom of religion, you know, taking my family values, you know, all these kind of things. There's this block of beliefs that ends up being kind of what moderns would call conservative beliefs that seem to be biblical. And then there's a bunch of liberal ones, like what you would classically think about social justice and fighting for the poor and not just trusting in capitalism and trickle down economics. And, you know, you got to make sure that you're for the marginalized and, you know, you got all this social justice stuff that seems to classically get put in the liberal ledger that clearly the prophets in the old and new Testament were about, you know? Right. And so 
um, they, you know, and people talk about, you know, who is more against the kind of exoskeleton religion of a, of a, of a culture than Jesus. So great. Put prayer back in schools. Everyone's saying a mantra on dying and going to hell because right. they don't really know Jesus. Who is more against that than Jesus? Read Matthew 23. You know, you've, you've, you've painted the outside, but the inside's all rotten and it's all going to hell. So, you know, there's kind of that more prophets calling out the powers, you know, spirit of, of kind of the liberal side of it, you know? And so, uh, so that's kind of the debate. So I would say, man, there's some, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to my church about this recently in regard to all the, the pressure that they think I need to be a spokesperson on, you know, the COVID stuff and the, the conspiracies and, you know, I get one email. It's like, you better fight for the conspiracies. And the next email is you better fight against them. And right. it's kind of the, the, the spirit, I think of a pastor, um, as I wrote on Carrie's blog a couple of weeks ago is Romans 14, which is like, okay, my job is to make sure I can reach liberals and conservatives with the gospel. And so I'm not going to get up and say one side is, is definitively Christian or not, or else I literally lose the stock and the, 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 the ear of the other side. And so Romans 14, you know, there's this division in the church over whether you should eat meat or not. And Paul goes, meat, not meat. It's not my job. The gospel's my job, you know. Right. So, um, so uh, there's going to be some issues that are conservative from a Christian vantage point and some that are liberal. Um, and so I think the debate becomes, can you hold something that is like anti-Christian at its core, you know, and, 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 and that, that's where it gets complicated, right? It's like, can you believe in a party that believes in a thing that's anti-Christian at its core and all the filter down and all the policy. And I think that's where people get really worked up and we got to constantly come back and go, what, what are the gospel implications to these things? Yeah. And it's interesting in some ways you're touching a little bit on the fact that can you actually love someone who doesn't agree with you on some of these things versus right. man, like the polarization of our culture right now is crazy. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, we tend to hang out with people who vote like us, talk like us, dress like us, and uh, you know that's not that's not good, man. Because then you just you just you're an echo chamber of your own ideas, and it can get it can get wonky for sure. Yeah. So yeah. So anyway, so I hope that answers the question somewhat. That um, you you know, and and I think what's really important is um, as you know, there's a lot of people talking about today, and I think it's really important is that not everything is political. Some things are philosophical. Some things are theological. Some things are psychological. Some things are scientific. You know, so when everything we're trained, everything has to fit into a liberal or conservative, you know, box. And so if someone's talking about the latest COVID numbers or something, we're like immediately interpreting it, trying to figure out what, what's their agenda. You right, know, it's, right. I don't know, it's, some, it's some doctor just sharing some data, you know, and it's like, Ooh, I know right. what he's after, you know, whatever. It's like, right. not every conversation is political. I know Bill Gates is pulling the strings to this yeah, exactly. uh, particular. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, uh, it's like not everything's political. Some things are actually fitted to other disciplines. Uh, you know, anybody who's gone to post high school, you know, knows that you got to be more nuanced than fitting everything into just these massive political boxes. categories. It's like, you know, so you read a scholar and you'll be like, my gosh, this guy just slayed it in this and this and this. And I believe all this stuff. And then you go on a Wikipedia and you find out the guy's completely opposite politically to you. You're like, could there be good ideas over there? <laughs> right. You know, you got to be a pretty sheltered individual to realize that maybe people who disagree with you may have some good stuff to say on both sides of this. So, yeah. And guaranteed not all the good ideas are on Facebook. Just put that out there. That, that is guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I want to mention to people, some of you are asking about uh, one person asked, how's a good God allow suffering? That's a question we get a lot. Mark's going to do part three on good and evil uh, Carrie Newhoff tackles that in a problem of God series we did. You can find it on our website. That's a longer question, uh, a great question. We're going to tackle all of that. 
Mark, uh, last thing I wanted to say, hey, if someone is wrestling with their own questions, their own doubts, what's some advice you'd give them? Resources you point them to, you know, uh, maybe they're going, man, I'm trying to swim through all this and I'm a little bit lost. Yeah. Like a Christian or a non-Christian? I would say like, non-Christian. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it was working through a bunch of the rational stuff uh, about Christianity. Um it was also me realizing it was like not just a truer story, but a better story for myself in the world, you know, than anything else. Uh, as I talk about in that evil and suffering sermon, like, what do you want to believe? The, the, the Hindu, you know, version of evil and suffering where people have to relive it. And so you shouldn't relieve it. Or are you going to believe in the Christian one that calls you to give up your own stuff in order to relieve suffering in this world? Like mm. it's actually a better, a better idea in the marketplace of ideas than just truer. So that that's part of it. It's more beautiful. It enhances life so much that you can, you know, you can, you can't even imagine the kinds of hope and diversity it brings and fulfillment and pleasure it brings in your life. Um, and then I would say, you know, where I found it also was um, outside of kind of going down the road of history and philosophy and psychology and, and then the meaning and the purpose and the fulfillment was actually reading the Gospels themselves. And I was, uh, you know, Augustine said the Bible is the face of God for us now. And I, that was my experience. It was like, I actually experienced the person of Jesus when I read the Gospels. And I was sitting there smoking a pack of cigarettes, reading, my, reading the Gospels outside of my high school you know, week in and week out, month in and month out. And I encountered God there. And so I would say, you know, I know it sounds old school, but go read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and do it again. And, and you know, uh, you're going to see someone there that's worth following. That's great. That's great. Well, uh, Mark, thanks for the series that you've done with us. Yeah, uh, thank you guys series. for having me. I love your church. Thank you all for, for letting me uh, preach for a few weeks. So I appreciate that. Yeah, and for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. That's great. Thank you.